around and listen. We were very happy to have Zero Harris with us tonight. She, she graduated with an MFA in 07 uh, in fine art. Um, she makes paintings, uh, mostly, and, and prints. Uh, so, you're uh, talking to us today. One exciting thing uh, and opportunity about Zero is that she is local to, to Otis. She works in the digital media department um, where um, I, I think some of you might have, have seen her. Uh, I, I just want to give her the floor. I think she can really speak for herself. And uh, the, the images are very um, narrative and um, very intricate. I, I think. Um, uh, some of you in particular who, who have, are dealing with issues of communicating stories in, in, uh, with a, either a moral or a uh, political statement, um, you'll find her work interesting. Uh, well, Phil, thank you for coming. All right, thank you for inviting me. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, I was in the MFA program um, here at Otis, and before that, I was in the MFA program at um, UCLA in the film school, and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be a writer and a producer, so um, <laughs> I ended up taking a painting class. One of the reasons why I went to UCLA over AFI, because I got accepted to both places, was because I had the option of being able to take other courses outside of the film department, and I was really interested in literature, anthropology, and art. So I took a painting to non-major class, and it was kind of set up in such a way that it was project oriented, we got to work on what we wanted to, we had to create a certain amount of work um, within that framework of summertime. And after that summer, I decided not to go back to film school. And instead, I worked on putting together a portfolio into grad school for art. Um, during that time, I was also working in two commercial art galleries. I, I can barely call them art galleries because the work was so incredibly commercial, it was like CC art like movie posters or like, you know, um, you know, impressionist looking work that really still looked like it was 19, I mean, sorry, 1890, you know, so, um, so I came to Otis to look around, I was considering a fifth year program or getting a bachelor's degree, believe it or not, in illustration, um, or um, whether or not I wanted to do a master's program, I wasn't really sure because I did a major in art for undergrad. And I really didn't have very many art classes or much training, even though I minored in art in undergrad at Howard University in D.C. And um, so basically there I just took like basic, found what you would call foundation classes here. I had like a year of foundation classes before I changed to the theater department. One of the main reasons why I changed the theater department was because art is very isolating and very lonely. And I, I'm a very social person, so I felt very lonely and very alienated and very isolated. And um, I wanted to collaborate with other people on projects and make use of what I felt were a lot of unexplored talents that, um, you know, I also had in addition to visual art. And again, it, was, it came back to story and narrative and an interest in literature, acting, performance, entertainment, and um, so basically I went to the theater department thinking, hey, I'll probably audition for something, it'll be not too stressful, because I, I always did theater and chorus in like high school and like elementary school and stuff like that. And um, actually theater was more of my focus until I got a job <laughs> um, drawing portraits and caricatures at an amusement park in Williamsburg, Virginia called Bush Garden. And at this particular amusement park, you, um, it was called Bush Gardens the Old Country. Each Bush Gardens has a different theme. That one was Old Europe, and it's because it was in Colonial Williamsburg. So there, um, when I was 14, one of my art teachers suggested that I could do this, that I could probably be like one of those people in the park. And I was like, really? You think I'm that good? So I went to an interview, and um, I was tired. I was 14 years old. I had been applying to work at McDonald's and Burger King. So it was definitely much more prestigious for me to be <laughs> drawing portraits and an amusement park. It was a commission-based job, and um, really you were put out and you started selling your As soon as your work, as soon as your portraits became saleable, that's when you were like officially hired. So saleable could be your first day all the way until three months. 
that was an average amount of time that it would take for your, your work, your portraits to become saleable. And they taught us a really specific technique for doing the portraits so that we could do them in a quick amount of time in the music department. It was just lines, you know, with Conte pencil and pastels on paper. So after the first couple of years, I felt like, okay, I've done this, I'm finished with it, I'm ready to move on to something else, I need a new challenge. And I really liked the caricatures. One of the reasons why I liked the caricatures is because the people were a whole lot more fun. <laughs> the people who got portraits, they were kind of like, oh, you know, my nose is like this, and you forgot one hair on my bang. And, you know, <laughs> the people who got caricatures done were like really exciting, and they really wanted to have fun and be made fun of. And the artists who did the characters were extremely creative, I thought, in my mind. I was like amazed. I would stand there and watch them in seven minutes create a whole entire world with just black and white lines and like crayons. And, you know, they would do it with accuracy and brilliance. They, off the top of their heads, they would just draw anything that you asked them to do. Well, some were better than others, obviously. But I was amazed by it. And so in my uh, third year of working at Bush Gardens, I started doing caricatures a couple days a week. Um, I felt like a lot of people who did caricatures came from backgrounds where they were really interested in like cartoons and um, comic strips and a lot of things that I wasn't really exposed to so much. I think I had, I mean, even with, at that time being a teenager, my exposure to art was mostly like, um, you know, from an art magnet program and like gifted and talented class and it was very Eurocentric. So it was very much focused on fine art, Eurocentric art as opposed to that type of um, visual imagery. So, um, being African American, also I'm from the South, I saw images of popular black art. And um, I, I really don't think I thought much about it at that time until I got to Howard University, which is an African American, you know, a, a historically black college and university in DC. And there I took a black in the arts class and, you know, other arts classes that really wanted to expose students to um, the history of African, Ameri uh, African Americans making art. Um, which most of us had not been able to, even though we were black and even though we were artists. We saw images of everyone else's artwork sometimes instead of our own, at, at least the historical work, as opposed to like popular black art that you would buy as like limited edition, I mean, uh, open edition posters and um, that kind of thing on the street or at the mall or at the flea market. So um, after, um, after the amusement park and coming to Howard and going into the theater department, once I arrived in the theater department, I thought, Hey, I think I want to do makeup art. So I felt like that is just like perfect combination of the visual art stuff and like my desire to collaborate and be around other people. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do prosthetics and like makeup for like Star Trek. That was like my dream job. So I started going out and working in different aspects of the entertainment industry. And in DC, that was doing, um, that was like news, it was theater, there was opera at the Kennedy Center. Um, uh, there was a little bit of filmmaking, but really not. It was like student projects and small things like that. And then there's also TV in the sense of doing makeup for politicians. But anyway, all of that comes in to play in my work because it's kind of socio-political and it's very personal and it's usually about people I meet and people that I talk to, things that I've read. Um, so the, my interest in narrative didn't really go away because of all these different entertainment genres that I was in, I wanted to get closer and closer to narrative. So I took the step even so much to try and become a writer and just stop the makeup stuff. And so that's really what brought me to, brought me to LA. So I thought that I would apply to film school when I got here, and I did, and I got in. And again, I just really wanted to be close to narrative. So when I started taking the painting for nomination class at UC LA, at UCLA, it did, believe it or not, even though I had done art before and I was like doing a character in the part and I knew about, you know, European the history of European art, it never occurred for me to make artwork that told stories until I was in that class. Because I was in the screenwriting program and because I was taking um, the painting class at the same time. I think there was also a critical link that brought it together. Um, that year my mom had come to visit me and we went to the Norton Simon Museum. And I think there was like a exhibit on Monet. <laughs> I'm telling you, she loves impressionism. with us. Anyway, so while I was in the museum gift shop, I picked up an art book and it was more exciting than the work that was on the walls to me. It was um, Chicano art. It was the collection by Cheech Marine. And a lot of people have problems with Cheech Marine because, you know, they're like, that's not really Chicano art. That's a really limited version of Chicano art, that's his taste, that's his collection. 
Well, I was really moved by the storytelling. I mean, I, ne I don't think that I ever saw an art book in my life, really, that moved me as much at that point, you know, with the colors, the vibrancy, the immediacy, the visceral quality of the work, and the storytelling, you know. And so I started doing more research on the individual artists. You know, I felt something really soulful coming out of it. And then that just led me on a journey to find more images and really try to figure out what I really, really, really like. Because even when I was an art major at Howard undergrad, um, I was I was in an experimental studio. So I was more interested in form and abstraction and trying to change, um, you know, trying to do something contemporary and modern that had never been done before in art. So, so yeah, so that book was sort of like the critical link that tied together what I was doing and this other thing that I thought was just going to be a hobby. So, um, in grad school, I got accepted to grad school, and while I was there, something started happening with my work, and this sort of like caricature thing started to come out. I don't know if it was like this, like, you know, because I always wanted to do that when I was a teenager, and I never really got a chance to develop it to the level I wanted to, and I, I, it's almost like I like fell back into it and picked up from that point. But now I had a whole voice, I had a voice because of all the, you know, social political readings that I had done and uh, political activism and community activism and um, having spent so much time in entertainment fields that dealt with storytelling. So I knew what I wanted to say and what I wanted to express, and that's the reason why I went to an MFA program as opposed to an illustration program, because I felt like I was just going to have to do assignments that people wanted me to do, and I felt like I didn't have time. I wanted to do what I wanted to do and express what I wanted to say. So, so this work here is, um, well, sometimes my work is not accurately, it's not accurate to the year that it was created. Sometimes you start something one year and then finish it like two or three years later. Or you were supposed to do it one year, but you didn't do it until two years later. <laughs> so, um, oh, the photograph, let me go back. While I was in um, grad school, I uh, here at Otis. <laughs> Um, I got to be uh, an art student on um, Top Design on Bravo. So this is an image of me and two of the other students who were <laughs> on the episode. So um, there's two two ways I often approach my work: the actual uh, the actual um, physical presentation of the work. Um, it's usually on panel because I like drawing and I, I guess I got accustomed to a hard surface along the way, you know, canvas is kind of soft, although I do like fabric. But anyway, so sometimes it, like this is just one piece. It's just one, actually this is paper. I don't normally work on paper, but I wanted to, I've been wanting to explore some more paper. So this is one unit. But then I have other work that this piece here in the back is seven panels that are put together, kind of like um, Asian scrolls, but it's panels that are put together and the narrative, as far as the time is concerned and the way it's composed, it scrolls across the panel. So I'm going to go back again to this one. Um, a lot of my work is um, based again on a unit of a literary device or something in history and anthropology that's called a personal experience narrative. It's basically like a little story or an anecdote that someone tells you, but it actually does have a technical name. So it's a little story that's usually shared in an intimate setting, you know, and someone talks about an experience that they had. For me, these stories have a lot of power, and um, I often find that you get to learn something about a person and their character, and that is very um, exciting and deep and wonderful to connect with a person in that way. And um, and from a socio-political point of view, people carry a lot of stories in them that don't often get expressed in popular mass media. So in this way, when I use these stories, I am able to, because of my experiences, see them in a personal way and also a political way. And so in the political way, I'm often thinking about um, you know issues like prejudice, um, you know, racism, um, homophobia, classism, ageism, you know, um, all different kinds of things. I'm also very interested in, um, in stories where characters go on a journey. So, just for example, this, this particular piece is based on an experience, a personal experience here that was being told by this little girl here. 
school with the niece of um, one of my best friends about 10 years ago. And we were having a conversation, the three of us. This was shortly after my friend's mother's funeral. It was like two days after it. And the niece wanted to tag on, she wanted to be with the big cool girl. My friend right here is biracial, and this is her cousin. And the three of us, I guess you consider us African American. So we were just talking about something, and you know, her niece just jumped in and she said, Yeah, but black people can be racist too. And we were all kind of taken aback. And so Rachel said to her cousin, she said, I mean, niece, no, cousin, sorry, not niece, cousin, how so? So her cousin went into this story about how she was a lifeguard during the summer, she's 16 years old, um, at the school in Miami, and how these black kids, that's what she said, she was very comfortable saying this, those black kids were bust in from across town to come to the swimming pool. And they were really rowdy and really bad. And she couldn't control them. So she, there was one particular girl that kept splashing water. So she told the girl, if you splash the water one more time, I'm putting you out of the pool. <laughs> and the girl called her a white bitch. And so me and my two friends started laughing. And it was the kind of laugh that was an uncomfortable laugh. You know, it was like funny, but you know, it, it was almost like we knew we were laughing, but we were hurting the girl's feelings, right? And it's something that really couldn't be explained that well. And it's the same reaction that a lot of black people who look at this have when they look at the work. So I know that I touch on something because of the reactions that I get from other people. Not only that, when I took the work to be framed at um, Aaron Brothers, well, I can sit, yeah, I didn't get framed there, but I, I took it there to get an estimate. There were two young Latino kids in there, and they were laughing. <laughs> and I said, why are you laughing? Is, is it funny? I, I acted like it wasn't funny. And so they were like, yeah, it's funny. And I was like, why is it funny? And they're like, well, this girl, and they pointed to you know, the white girl, they were like, she's trying to control everything, and it's a fool. You're supposed to splash. <laughs> so um, at that point, I hadn't actually colored the work. So with keeping in mind what they said, I actually decided to make sure that I tried to represent the kids in, in different colors of like shades of brown. Because um, because those kids could identify with that experience. So, um, I actually have a narrative on my blog about this particular piece. I don't do narratives on all of this because it's really time specific, but it's like a little, probably it's probably like a 750 word essay about this particular piece. I'm not going to talk as much about all the work, but I'm just trying to give you some insight into where the work comes from. Um, so this is 18th Street Art Center in Santa Monica, and this piece, this, uh, show was called Patriot Act, and um, this work actually got a little bit of a write-up in, in the LA Times. Well, my name got mentioned and the piece was mentioned or described, it wasn't really a review. Um, in the LA Times, the LA Weekly, and the Pacific Palace. This work is based on um, this guy right here, his name is Rodney, and uh, he was a neighbor of mine at the time, I still consider him a friend of family. He's Haitian at the time, he was 22, and he had done two tours in the Iraq War already. So um, I talked to him about his experiences in the war. Now this is not like an intellectual guy at all, this is just like an average young kid who was 18 years old, the day he signed up for the military, he had just turned 18, and six months later he went to Iraq. Okay? So I um, created this piece about him coming back to America after you know his, his second tour. And he he said that um there's usually a parade when the you know the uh, soldiers come back. Um and he really didn't want the fanfare. He just wanted to be alone because in the military there was like no place to be alone. Like during the war. He wanted his own space. So these are detailed shots of the panel. Um, so really this is a soldier's story and I wanted to deal with the feelings that he probably felt when he came back from the war about being in America again um, and having to find his place in society after what he went through. In many ancient cultures when um, a warrior comes back from war, their rituals to cleanse their spirit of what they took on during the war. But we don't really have something formal like that in our society. And my dad was in Vietnam for nine years, and he still messed up. So I consider this to be a piece that really talks about that experience of soldiers coming back from war. So um, in this piece, 
um, Rodney goes to, I mean, in the real story, he goes to a hotel to get a room. And he, even though he has money, he can't get a room because he doesn't have a credit card. He doesn't have a credit card because he was 18 years old and then he signed up for the military and went to Iraq and was there for two tours. So he never had an opportunity to get a credit card and they couldn't give him a room. Even in his military uniform with his bag. So, This piece is also based on his life, or his experience being in rock, and it's foiled with another story. I can't really, I don't think I can make this piece too much bigger. Um, that's one of the things about making work that's an odd shape and not really in the, the standard photo size. <laughs> it's really hard sometimes to, um, to deal with that when it's print and uh, putting it online and, and things like that. Um, so you really have to experience the work. I mean, I know a lot of people say that, but you really do. I think the experience the work like close up and first hand to get it, to get the full experience of the expansiveness of the narrative and how time is being expanded or compressed. So, um, so here in this top portion of the piece, I know it's not easy to see. Uh, Rodney is standing here talking to a group of Iraqis, and there are other soldiers that are cutting down the palm trees. There's a UN truck right here and uh, Shakna is in the background. In this part, there's a tent, and the soldiers are in the tent, and Rodney's walking out of the tent. And here, there's a silhouette, if you can see it. There's a silhouette of kind of a naked man in a Christ-like position. Kind of like a ghost, kind of like a shadow that's looming over the men. And then here, this is Rodney coming out of the front of the tent. So it's three different spaces, but one narrative to me. So, think about that. What I asked him, is you know how do you, how do you guys deal with sexuality when you're there all together all that time? And he said you know a lot of guys have a whole lot of problems problems back home. So he told me about Jody, this um, sort of like character that um, is responsible for everything that goes wrong, and it's like a running joke in the military figure that doesn't really have a look, but is present. If if, if your girl keeps on you back home, Jody got her. If your cake fell on the floor, Jody knocked it out of your hand. So, um, so I wanted to put that in there um, as um, you know, this haunting idea that anything that goes wrong has to do with Jody. The tree being cut down comes from um, a book I was reading, written by um, Riverbend, girl blogger, who was an Iraqi woman who was blogging about the war from an Iraqi perspective. Um, while living there, and it was taking place for like three or four years. So one in, one thing that she said is that no one could understand why the American soldiers were cutting down the palm trees. And her guess was that because palm trees in our society are so symbolic of like vacations and paradise and things like that, that they did it. They cut down the trees so that when the media came in, they wouldn't have the trees there anymore to have that kind of symbolic representation. And the trees are very spiritual, like just like an avatar, or maybe some of you have heard of other spiritual trees like the baobab, home tree. Um, they're very spiritual to the Iraqi people. They have rituals and you know, and songs and dances that go around the trees, and they use the dates for different different reasons. Plus, there it's a desert, so there's not that much shade to begin with. So cut down the trees, like <laughs> you know, we might not be able to find any shade for about 50 more miles. So. Um, also, I wanted to present the mix on the Iraqi side of things, the mix, the mix attitudes of, the, of Iraqi people. Just like you would come to America, if someone were to tag us, there'd probably be mixed attitudes. Some people would probably be like, "Yeah, down with America," and some other people would be like, "You know what? No, this is mine." <laughs> so, um, same thing in Iraq. Um, there were people like, "Yeah, Americans come help us, get the job out," and then there were others who were like, "You know what? No, let us deal with our own problems." So. Um, so sometimes the work is not really based on stories so much as moments in time. That's how I think of them, like a specific frozen moment. And that's what I think of as, as a portrait. In a sense. Um, current events, I like to do work about current events. This one is, ha this is a, about a 
a man named Sean Bell who was shot 51 times unarmed. Um, the day of his, the day that his wedding was supposed to happen, he was at his bachelor party. This happened in New York City, and um, the next day, his fiance, her bride, what do you call her? She was almost a wife. Um, she went ahead and went through with having the wedding to take place, but it was said it was a funeral. So again, I was interested in layering these two different moments of time to create one particular work of art. Um, experimenting with using text in the work and comic strips and well, when I was in grad school, some of the students said, um, your work has a relationship to graphic novels. And I was like, how could it? I've never read one. <laughs> <laughs> so recently, I've actually started reading some. And I'm like, oh, OK. It gives me ideas for uh, you know, other um, elements and tools that I can use to tell stories. So I do look at them now to get ideas. And actually, a few of them I've actually enjoyed. They tend to be women's stories, and they tend to be um, not very traditional. Um, it's going to be autobiographical also. Uh, this piece here was created from some, I was reading a book about, the <laughs> book was about menstruation. It was a cross-cultural anthropological study on menstruation in different societies. And I was telling Lorenzo about this earlier, that all of my work is not necessarily based on personal experience narratives. And also, my work tends to be pretty literal as opposed to poetic. This particular work is, I think, more poetic than most of my work. And what happened here is that um, I was reading about a ritual that happens in Australian Aborigine, Aboriginal society where the patron or the man that the young woman is betrothed, betrothed to will come and like rub her breast in a very ritual public kind of way at certain times. It's supposed to bring about fertility in the girl and help her become a woman. And the breasts aren't really thought of as sexual, as, as sexual or sexual objects so much as the way they are in America. This was all very, very difficult for me to comprehend, even to the point where this man who's like her patron and his sisters even are considered the fathers of this girl until they get married. They have a very different idea of kinship than what we have here in the West. So I, I wanted to make a painting out of that, but I didn't want to um, exoticize the culture because it wasn't something I was directly familiar with. So I tried to relate it back to things that made sense to me or came out of my experience, like ancient Egyptian history and um, you know fertility rights and courtship and, and love and you know uncertainty and, and things like that. Coming into womanhood. Oh, it's called Kai Papa Ford when you space mine up there. Did they always wanted to have a job in Star Trek so <laughs> uh, sometimes work is just funny and silly and a little edgy. So I fall between different places with the work. Sometimes it's kind of more popular art, sometimes it's more like fine art, sometimes it's just not really easy to define. Um, quick pieces like this um, after pieces that have taken a lot out of me or a long time just so I can accomplish something pretty quickly and do this. That's a sketch. What I can see. Um, this might have been one of my first experiments with putting text onto the work as a personal experience narrative. And um, <laughs> Also, since I was experimenting with South Park, as like the style. Can you talk a little more about the style? But now, uh, things have changed a little more. But definitely have style. Tell me what that is. Well, <laughs> uh, especially they have because you're referencing styles, and so when you're referencing styles. That you're aware of the the treatment. How do you use different how do you different traditions? Mm -hmm. well, I feel like I'm exploring and experimental a little bit in what I'm doing. Like some of the work has lines around it and some doesn't, like this one doesn't. Um, some of it has more of a folky look to it, and um, some of it has more of a caricature look to it. Um, this piece I created 
created from a narrative that I encountered or was, was uh, told to me while I was going, I was in um, New Orleans after Katrina. This is the top part of it. I'll answer the question in a moment.
is also a Katrina piece. And these are houses, um, shotgun houses, and um, irredeemable tombs right here. Um, and uh, a graveyard. Thank you. 